will be talking to us today about statistical considerations in biomarker driven and clinical on uh, sorry oncology clinical trials. Uh, Chen is an associate professor of oncology in the School of Medicine and an associate professor of biostatistics in the School of Public Health. He, he actually started out as an engineer and has a master's in biophysics, but then uh, switched to biostatistics and has a master's and PhD in biostatistics from the University of Michigan. Uh, he uh, started as an assistant professor here at Hopkins in 2015 and is now an associate professor. Uh, he is interested, obviously, in randomized trials for cancer. Uh, and he is the site head of the statistics division for the NRG Statistical and Data Management Center, uh, for the, which is an oncology clinical trials network. He has well over 100 publications, and we're delighted to have him uh, speak here today. Thank you, Dr. Jeb, and for the invitation and nice introduction. Um, so today, uh, I will give a uh, maybe overview on the, this topic uh, by microdriven oncology trials. Uh, the reason I choose this topic uh, is twofold. One is that uh, as a user, I've been have uh, some experience, um, good or not, or not that good, good experience uh, um, on this topic. And then, of course, I do have some ongoing methodological interest on this and some work. Um, but today, I guess I'll focus on the overviews um, considering the audience, including the students and uh, and all trialists who may not necessarily necessarily um, involved in oncology trials uh, in daily basis like I am. Uh, and uh, But hopefully uh, after this or going on during the talk, you will uh, relate uh, what we've been thinking about in oncology trials uh, in your own studies and uh, see maybe hopefully we have some uh, thing to discuss together and even work together. Um, at least uh, energy oncology is uh, that uh, much of my motivations and experience uh, not only come from my uh, uh, trial experience with Hopkins, I'm also working with uh, <clears throat> energy oncology, which is one of the four adult cancer cooperative group founded by an, an NCI and CTAP program, uh, where we conduct uh, uh, mostly randomized phase two and phase three trials. and. Uh, that's how I get involved in this topic. So just a very brief um, background on why we're um, talking about the biomarker-driven oncology trials. So as you may uh, surely aware, uh, there have been significant progress in genomic technology, tumor biology, drug discovery. So we now actually have a relatively easy access uh, and a, a lot significantly decreased cost and uh, increasing availability to next generation genomic sequence sequencing. We actually often face the situation where we do have uh, a number of, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few number of uh, quote unquote biomarkers, but we do not know how to use it. But on the other end, uh, on the other hand, uh, um, the tumor biology uh, knowledge has been exploding. So we are now have uh, um, increasing an uh, attempt that to de develop targeted therapies as um, and to uh, toward the end of the precision oncology medicine. And historically, the uh, oncology trials has been uh, can be roughly divided into phase one, two, and three. And then in phase one trials, we typically conducted with a mixture of solid tumors, so where the two uh, phase two and phase three trials are uh, histologic and pathologic focused in phase two trials, we typically ask that uh, uh, does a treatment with the selected dose that has been defined in, uh, or at least uh, ad relatively adequately to explore in phase one, uh, will likely improve clinical outcome within a particularly, uh, within a particular context. And the, historically, this context has been defined based on histology and uh, pathological features. Now, with the introduction of biomarker and precision medicine idea, then the, we what we essentially are encountering is that uh, how to refine the definition of the context to incorporate the molecular context. Consequent, uh, consequently, uh, we now have a, a greater consequence uh, being wrong or right 
in the sense that uh, we need to ask questions as to whether the biomarker is a prognostic or predictive, which I will explain uh, shortly, and to just make sure that we're all on the same page. And in addition to whether the intervention itself is uh, effective or not. And com collectively, then we are uh, may also asking the strategy and the how to combine and the marker and the intervention efficiently, if possible. So um, this is something that you may um, may you may already aware, but uh, just uh, to keep us uh, all on the same page. So prognostic markers here, which statistically speaking, is a main effect where the effect does not vary by treatment, which therefore can be concluded from even single arm trial without randomization. For predictive marker, it statistically is the interaction between treatment and uh, biomarker. And uh, therefore we are looking for effect, treatment effect, the, the effect differ by treatment or in the presence or absence of biomarker, the benefit of treatment uh, is diff of different magnitude. Um, and of course, in this case, then it has to be assessed through um, multi-arm trial. Here is an example of prognostic marker uh, in the breast cancer setting. And the HER2 positive is a prognostic uh, factor in uh, menopausal uh, ER positive uh, breast cancer treated with the adjuvant uh, hormone therapy. Uh, it's not, uh, as, as you can see in the first plot, and the Kaplan-Meier curve separates well and indicating the prognostic factor. And this is a prognostic factor. Uh, in the in the lower bottom, and uh, you see that uh, the treatment effect within uh, the HER2 negative and as well as the HER2 positive are similar, and suggesting that this does not uh, the it is uh, the prognostic effect uh, does not differ by does not differ by the uh, marker status, and therefore this is only a prognostic but not predictive marker. And here is uh, old but classic example of a prognostic marker in lung cancer setting, where um, we're looking at the EGFR mutation status, whether it's pos on the left is the EGFR positive, on the right is EGFR negative. And the, uh, the target therapy, um, which is one of the older generation called it Jafitinib, and it's extremely effective if, you, if the patient uh, carry EGFR mutation, but it does not perform very well at all. And on the right, as you can see here, where the survival, the PFS curve is clearly inferior than the control. So in this case, the status of EGFR and, and selects and, and which patients should would benefit from the uh, treatment. When we're speaking of uh, the biomarker-driven studies, so we are we want to um, remind remind ourselves that there are actually a different aspect of the biomarker development. And we in, in this talk uh, we assume that all the biomarkers already are uh, have analytic validity, which means that uh, oh, the markers is able to. Um, accurately, reliably, and produce, reproducibly to measure and predict the presence of the genotype of interest. Uh, with this, and then uh, some biomarkers may already have well-established clinical validity, some not necessarily, um, uh, which leads to different type of designs. So the clinical validity uh, means that the ability to detect or predict the associated disorder or phenotype. Uh, last but not least, uh, the more of most interest is the clinical utility of a given biomarker, which is, is simply say, states that uh, how to use um, the biomarker to guide um, the clinical treatment uh, decisions. And uh, uh, a biomarker has a good clinical utility if it can reliably prompt clinical action that benefits patients. That's the ultimate goal through the trial design. So um, clinical uh, 
here um, a, a few more uh, concepts. Uh, um, one is that uh, um, the marker evaluation not necessarily have to be uh, evaluated through prospective studies. It can also be carried out uh, in retrospective studies. And uh, uh, I will talk very briefly about uh, how the, this type of design well, can be can be conducted. Um, for prospective studies in, uh, in the terminology of um, and NCI trials, uh, we consider two types of um, biomarkers primarily. One is the so-called integral biomarker, where the test inherent in the design from the onset of study and it must be performed in real time for the conduct of trial. And this, this test essentially uh, need to be used to establish eligibility for patient stratification or assigned treatment. There are uh, another um, class of biomarkers, we call it integrated, in the sense that these tests may, uh, may be performed in real time, but don't have to. Um, the, but the, the crust is that we do need to include a complete plan for specimen collection and uh, lab procedures. And we do have a very well-defined objective and statistical analysis plan to validate the planned um, biomarkers. Uh, we will focus um, much of this uh, discussion will then um, focus on the integral biomarkers because uh, these are the, um, to some extent, that uh, um, require careful thinking about how to inc incorporate them in trial design. Um, and the, how to choose the proper design. Uh, well, should be guided by the credential of the biomarker itself, meaning that how much we know about the, the, the biomarker in terms of its prognosis, whether it's prognostic or predictive with respect to a particular treatment. And depending on such knowledge, then we will proceed with uh, different designs. I will focus on three particular designs. Uh, the first is called the enrichment design where we do have a very strong credentials. And there's strong evidence exists that exist, and that a targeted therapy benefit only in the biomarker positive group. And another, uh, I'll also spend much, some time on the so-called stratified design, where it can be that it could be in different scenarios. If we do have a strong credential for the biomarkers, then uh, where the treatment is likely to be more beneficial in the marker positive group, but maybe uh, a meaningful benefit also possible in the marker negative group, where we may have some uh, particular design that we should we should consider. But if there is a weak credential, then uh, where the treatment is expected to work in overall population, then we might need to think about some other strategies. Lastly, uh, I will introduce the biomarker directed or so-called hybrid design, where uh, most of the, in most cases this is uh, used when the biomarker is uh, itself is prognostic and can be already used for uh, patient selection. So starting with the uh, enrichment design, where we uh, only enroll marker positive patients, this is a design where um, you do have uh, a a marker that can be with a well-established marker cutoff point and the risk and there are strong rationale to believe that the response only confined to marker positive patient. And of course, the uh, the biomarker need to be assay, assessed uh, uh, in fairly quickly fashion. And if these can be satisfied, then we can consider biomarker uh, enrichment design and where you only uh, keep patients who are marker positive and then randomize them. Of course, uh, uh, for the, this is for uh, the for confirmatory purpose. If you only meant to uh, uh, conduct a trial for discovery purposes, then you can also uh, consider single arm or some other, uh, uh, other designs. 
The next design is the biomarker stratified design where you enroll all comers uh, with a biomarker uh, positive or negative status as one of the stratification factors. But within each, within marker positive or negative patients, uh, you will randomize it separately um, because it's a randomization, uh, because it's a stratification factor. And what you would need for the biomarker would, uh, is that, of course, it still need to, it also need to be assessed quickly. And uh, um, generally speaking, you do not want to have a very low prevalence for the marker positive group. Um, and, uh, and depending on whether the cutoff is well established, uh, we um, may or may not uh, need to consider, or we, we, we will need uh, to consider different strategy, uh, which I will show shortly. So as you see, um, with the um, marker certified design, you essentially, the, the first key question that you want to ask yourself is if and how to prioritize the multiple hypotheses that are within the marker positive group, the marker negative group, as well as the overall population. Uh, because oh, dep depend that's highly um, content specific. It will depend on the, your knowledge of the biomarker itself, as well as the drug class and many other factors. And the first scenario is uh, where you believe that uh, the, if the new treatment unlikely to work in the marker negative group, unless it works first in the marker positive group. If that happens, then you can consider to use uh, some kind of sequential testing where you first test within the marker positive group for treatment effect. And uh, if positive, then you um, kind of compare treatment treatments in marker negative group with the alpha recycling strategy. Uh, you can also, unequally uh, splitting alpha between the marker positive group and a negative group. And the reason that you may consider unevenly split is because in this setting, you typically would uh, hope you want to uh, make a better bet on, bet on the um, on the marker positive subgroup because that's your underlying uh, uh, rationale. Uh, this strategy, of course, have uh, allowed you and to have a rigorous assessment for the treatment effect uh, in both marker subgroups. It also has to have some downsides, and, and especially it, it, in terms of feasibility where it requires a large sample size. And therefore, uh, because you are essentially um, running like two separate trials where each of them, uh, especially for the uh, splitting alpha, uh, setting, then you essentially have two two separate trials where each are not uh, even at the full typical uh, temporal error. Um, accordingly, it also have low power um, when you compare to a design that tests the overall population. And um, if there is a moderate treatment effect uh, that's uh, present, present uh, across all marker subgroups. Um, because if you do not have differential treatment effect or within um, each subgroup, then of course you can imagine that uh, the power would be low when you test them separately. Uh, the second scenario is actually be increasingly um, uh, of interest where an um, after um, the primary interest, which is a marker positive group, the overall population is your secondary interest. In this case, so you may encounter the so-called marker positive overall strategy. Uh, I want to jump into um, the, some potential issue, which I hope that's uh, somewhat uh, self-explanatory. Uh, imagine that uh, um, you do have some significant uh, uh, result in, uh, you do have a significant effect uh, in marker positive group. And because um, you are testing 
I probably want to use this as an example, which um, is uh, um, recently argued by uh, our friends in, in, from NCI. And um, so here is the considered uh, uh, extreme uh, 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 a case. There is a possibility that uh, so CPS is a particular um, biomarker in occurred and used increasingly in immunotherapy. And uh, the finding that uh, um, people have been hypothesizing is that uh, for higher expression of CPS, uh, a patient may be benefited from immunotherapy, but for lower uh, uh, expression levels, the uh, patient may or may not necessarily benefit from them. So here is uh, some illustration that uh, the um, postulate, where uh, in this case, the treatment effect only exists in CPS greater than 20 and greater than 20. Uh, and then for subsequent uh, uh, subgroups, uh, the all there is no treatment effect at all. Uh, and if so, then if you look combine the two uh, two groups um, shown as the blue and the yellow, then you will still have some uh, marginal treatment effect when you look at the overall population. This even could be an uh, uh, still marginally um, beneficial if you include a, a large range of patients who may be not benefiting. Uh, <clears throat> so from here, you can see that uh, this is uh, potentially problematic. If you first test uh, um, a marker positive group, then the overall population, even with the alpha recycling strategy, um, because you may still likely to uh, recommending ineffective uh, treatment to these uh, quote unquote, generally speaking, uh, marker negative groups across board. And the, uh, and the reason behind is that uh, there is no strict, uh, for this uh, marker positive overall design, there is no strict control uh, on controlling uh, the marker negative group who, uh, uh, when they are not uh, 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 different in, in the micronectic groups. So uh, some proposal has been uh, developed. And one of them is, is the so-called micro sequential test design. And it was developed uh, to address the concern of the low power in the subgroup specific strategy that I showed in the scenario one when moderate treatment effect is present across marker uh, subgroups. <clears throat> so the idea is that uh, um, we want to control the probability of recommending an ineffective therapy to either marker positive or negative group at a, at a fixed significant level. So it can be carried out that uh, where we uh, first test a marker positive group, if, a significant, if it is significant, at uh, uh, alpha one level, this alpha one uh, is uh, smaller than the typical alpha level. For example, you can choose uh, if we consider a typical alpha is 0.05, this can be chosen as 0.03 or something like that. Uh, and if it's uh, significant, then we will test a marker negative group at uh, a high alpha level uh, of 0.05. And if it's uh, uh, still significant, then we will be able to uh, recommend the treatment for both marker positive group or negative group. If uh, in this part, the test result is negative, then we'll only recommend the treatment for the marker positive group patients. Now back to the first test. And um, if an um, the test of uh, whether the treatment effect is uh, significant at the alpha one level and uh, within marker positive group is, is, fail, is failed, then we will test the overall, popula uh, overall population at uh, a reduced level of uh, alpha minus alpha one um, because to adjust for multiplicity. And if this is a, a remain significant, then we'll be able to recommend this to both positive and negative patient or uh, or, 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 or the patient. If not, then 
we will not recommend the treatment to any uh, subgroup patients. So um, by conducting such a sequential test, uh, you will be able to uh, properly control um, the probability of recommending um, an infective ther therapy to any subgroups. Therefore, you are able to rigorously assess treatment within and the marker positive and negative group and zero R. And you can show that uh, through simulation that the power improvement over the sequential uh, subgroup specific strategy in the scenario one setting um, when the treatment effect is homogeneous across uh, marker groups. There are also some downsides though, that where it will require where it will require slightly larger sample size than the sequential subgroup specific strategy. Because in the first test, you need to um, test it at a reduced level instead of a full of a 0.05. Uh, the third scenario is that uh, where it's not entirely certain whether the biomarker is predictive at all. And in this setting, uh, uh, a so-called fallback strategy has been proposed. And in this case, that uh, we one can first test the overall population if it is significant at a reduced type of error, R41. And if it's positive, then we will just go ahead to recommend the treatment for all patients. If not, then we will test the marker positive group. And if it is significant at the level R1 minus R1, Excuse me. Um, and if it's significant, then we will recommend the treatment to the marker positive group. If not, then we will not recommend at all. So basically, um, this strategy uh, should be considered when um, we are expecting that uh, there is a broadly effective uh, a treatment and, and uh, the biomarker has a weak cre credential. And and we want to test um, overall population as a priority. So in this sense, the, the, this fallback uh, design offers a contingency plan to uh, accommodate the treatment evaluation in marker positive group if for some reason the test in the overall population is negative. And of course, in this as well as in other strategy that I just discussed, or the level at which the over, uh, overall marker uh, and, and the marker positive subgroup all need to will be tested should be prospectively specified. It cannot be chosen post hoc. Compare um, com compared with the traditional RCT, then uh, this strategy only um, have a small inflation of the sample size because uh, it is in the first first test that we uh, we use, uh, you will be you will be testing it at a slightly reduced alpha level for the overall overall population. Uh, it also has come with uh, some limitations, uh, in which that uh, and just like uh, the marker positive overall design, and uh, you it does not control the probability of incorrectly recommending treatment to treat to marker negative patients when they do not benefit from it. Therefore, use this design should be limited to settings where uh, the treatment is expected to be widely beneficial and the marker pre prevalence is low, typically um, maybe less than 20%. And if that's the case, then the overall result are unlikely to be driven by the marker positive result. And therefore, uh, uh, and in that case, conducting a subgroup specific design may be infeasible, such that you may consider this fallback strategy. So as you can see that depending on the credential of the biomarker, one may consider different uh, analysis plan and a design, of course, um, even within the marker stratified design. Another part, um, another design is a so-called uh, biomarker-directed design, 
uh, I'm using um, a, a existing example to illustrate the idea. So uh, the the trial is called the Taylor X, which is has been um, practiced changing. So this setting is that uh, um, for a uh, breast cancer patient who are HR positive or HER2 negative, as we know the negative patients, and uh, there is a well established 21 gene score that is prognostic for recurrence, which was established by uh, one of the energy trial B14. And SABP B14. And it has also been shown that this biomarker 21 gene score uh, is a predictor of uh, chemotherapy benefit uh, through another trial, um, B20. Now, the rationale of designing this Taylor X trial is that uh, because uh, it's in the role of uh, um, a 21 gene score is well established and prognostic. So for patients who are deemed to be uh, high risk of recurrence, which is defined as uh, the recurrence score greater than 25, patient has been already uh, shown that they will benefit from chemotherapy and hormone therapy combined. So this patient will go directly treated by this uh, intensive therapy. And for patients who have low risk of recurrence, these patients will be uh, uh, excused from uh, chemotherapy and will only receive hormone therapy. But for these intermediate risk patients, and when the trial the, when the trial was launched, the question was uh, uh, emerging and important: is that for this patient, how what's their optimal uh, treatment? So the trial was designed as an inferiority trial that to evaluate that uh, whether hormone therapy is not inferior to the chemotherapy plus hormone therapy for these patients. So here, the role of uh, biomarker is not is to direct which treatment regimen that the patient should be used as a risk stratification, and then to guide the, the treatment decision uh, to be evaluated subsequently. So back to um, all of this, then the question would probably become that uh, when to use which when you are facing an integral biomarker. Um, there's uh, apparently a lot of considerations uh, and goes into that. Um, here I'm list a few, including that uh, the establishment of uh, the marker risk class or as well as whether the cut up the cut point is well established. And it, uh, a fact, uh, an important issue that I haven't um, elaborated is the prevalence of the marker positive group. But um, except um, we kind of alluded that uh, in the fallback design, you do not want to have a high prevalence of marker positive uh, treatment to drive your overall treatment effect evaluation. But uh, there's a um, and uh, from the practical perspective for, for a, st uh, a statistician who designed these trials, it means um, it turns out that uh, um, the close form um, to incorporate these uh, um, factors that have been could be quite challenging. So what we typically do is that to conduct uh, uh, multicolor simulations to evaluate uh, operating characteristics of these. Uh, um, issues because there are so many factors that need to be considered, including the prevalence of uh, the microbiotic cases. Then, of course, I like I mentioned, uh, um, the credential of whether the putative treatment benefit is confined to a um, specific marker status, uh, status subgroup, subset is important consideration and lead to the uh, specific designs. I mentioned multiple times on uh, um, the timeliness, whether the assay turnaround time um, can be done uh, fair, fairly rapidly, or uh, is it an important factor to determine whether we are going to uh, use an integral biomarker or it has to be an integrated biomarker. And uh, the turnaround time also sometimes ties to whether this can be done uh, in local sites or it has to be conducted in central setting. Um, and uh, uh, here, 
we've been so far we've been just talking about a single biomarker and uh, uh, later uh, if time permits uh, I will briefly mention platform trial where central testing can play an even bigger role and uh, uh, certainly then the logistics become even further uh, even bigger problem so across these uh, um, and trial designs, uh, one important aspect that I want to mention is uh, uh, what kind of innovative design possibilities that can be integrated or um, be included in these settings. Uh, from practical perspective, uh, my our experience have been that uh, for these designs, first off, um, you intra monitoring is something that uh, you uh, of course, uh, included in all randomized studies, but in particularly useful uh, in these settings, and the and uh, especially fertility monitoring, um, because when you have uh, uh, multiple subgroups and to take care, and using properly using fertility monitoring will effectively help you to prioritize the multiple um, subgroups. So for example, in the biomarker stratified design, the fertility monitoring can be flexibly incorporated within the marker positive group, marker negative group, and the overall population separately. And uh, um, you can use that to help you prioritize and drop uh, the subgroups where you, um, there is a clear evidence that uh, the treatment is not benefiting a particular subgroup. And this idea then can be generalized more broadly to the so-called adaptive enrichment design, where you prospectively using uh, advanced statistical tools, um, including patient uh, machinery, and to adaptive enriching your patient population when you have uh, multiple subgroups that you want to prioritize uh, uh, seamlessly. Alternatively, uh, you can one can start with uh, the marker positive group and then expand to marker negative group if there are uh, increasing um, evidence. Uh, this uh, is uh, a situation that uh, um, have been only proposed but not really uh, being used in practice as far as I I know. And um, now uh, I will. Um, which gear to and discuss very briefly about integrated biomarker. And talking about integrated biomarker, um, we we'll probably want to first talk about the so-called uh, the prospective retrospective plans. We this is a, um, a less resource and time intensive approach when the specimens are collected, and and when the follow up or the clinical and uh, endpoints have already occurred. So. Uh, here I have noted that this is, of course, an opportunity for some other designs, such, uh, such as uh, matched case control uh, design or, met, uh, or case cohort design. But broadly speaking, uh, this is an opportunity where you utilizing an, a retrospective uh, um, trial information, but have a prospective analysis plan. So it has uh, uh, actually equal important role in biomarker development, uh, especially under some conditions such as that uh, uh, where you have sufficient number of patient samples that to be very to be representative of the trial population, and you have a pre-planned prospective written protocol that clearly state the objectives, the method, and, and analytical plans, power considerations, X, Y, Z, um, based on the specimen availability. And Importantly, in this uh, prospective retrospective plans, you still need to have a lockdown test where the biomarker is fully defined and validated and not changed during the study. And the SE also, of course, should be conducted blindly to the clinical data in order to be um and, and to maintain this and uh, the integrity. So in our inside work, this has been played actually um, 
quite important role. And we have uh, um, NCI have a separate funding mechanism to fund uh, um, groups as well as uh, external investigators to conduct a prospective retrospective analysis to uh, evaluate uh, and sometimes identify novel biomarkers using the completed randomized clinical trials. And there have been some uh, uh, findings that are already been implemented and used in practice. Uh, there are also some uh, reporting, well-established reporting quite a re requirement called remark that uh, um, guide how should one should report these findings. I want to mention some, uh, in my opinion, useful design in this setting um, where you are utilizing um, a retrospective assay, a retrospective um, trial. Uh, so one of these designs is so-called as adaptive signature design. It was designed, uh, it was proposed to evaluate whether the experimental regimen is effective in the overall population or subset patient while developing the biomarker classified simultaneously. This is a situation where you do not have a, a well-established cutoff or um, um, in general speaking. So you want to um, both identify as well as uh, um, evaluate. So the design essentially modifies the fallback analysis strategy um, that I we just uh, talked about in a learned then confirm fashion. And um, if the treatment comparison for all treatment is not significant uh, in the overall population at the reduced alpha level, then we will either split the patient into training and testing subgroup or use k fold cross validation um, to a, a and to develop the biomarker and then to evaluate the efficacy in the identified subgroup. Uh, this, there are simulations uh, published by Bradley and, co uh, and a colleague showing that the cross-validation approach um, can substantially improve the power of identifying marker positive subgroup that is benefit from the new treatment. So um, um, I mentioned this in part because I feel there is uh, a great potential and uh, currently underutilized under uh, in the immunotherapy era where the biomarker has been increasingly used, but uh, the cutoff uh, has not been really well established in many settings. So here is a, a summary, which I summarized the design that I covered so far, as well as some design that I will cover shortly. And uh, in for the enrichment design, we talked that uh, they can be either conformatory intent or discovery and depend, but the crust information is that they are only be interested in the marker positive group. And uh, there are uh, opportunities for adaptive design and to be incorporated mostly through group sequential uh, or two stage design. And, for biomarker stratified design, depending on whether it's a, a conformatory intent or discovery, then we of course have different choice of endpoint. Uh, with um, PFS stands for progression-free survival, and the OVO and the OS stands for overall survival. Both are time to event endpoint. OR is a short-term objective response rate. It's a, a binary end, endpoint, and so and often used in single arm trials. So and depending on the intent or uh, the uh, objective of uh, the, the trial, then we have different choice and consideration for the endpoint as well as the adaptive design uh, um, components that can be implemented. So more broadly, um, I want to briefly touch on that uh, how the integral biomarkers uh, have been proposed and used uh, so far in the oncology setting. Um, as far as I understand, um, uh, the master protocol concept has been first proposed probably uh, in oncology due to the advances of the precision, precision medicine uh, and the genomics technology, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, so there is a lot of discussions and uh, all these 
uh, we have um, in the oncology world, we have some bittersweet experience on how to use them. Um, but I think uh, because of in the pandemic, due to the pandemic, I think the idea of master protocol and the machinery uh, for um, uh, many adaptive, adaptive design component ideas, uh, including outcome depend, um, uh, outcome dependent randomization, invasion, machinery have been quickly um, re-engineered for the COVID, for the COVID treatment trials. Um, many product, uh, many platform trials has been uh, implemented and then um, published. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Jeffs just mentioned that in the most recent the journal club, we talked about some trial like that. Um, so within the context of the biomarker driven trials, so there are two diverged pathways. One is uh, and to some extent back to the future where we have a, a bunch of single arm trials for the discovery purpose. And the other is go big where we have multi-arm randomized studies combined. So because of time, I would just very briefly mention this idea of basket trial, which you can, to some extent, you can think this is, we're looking at, we're using a single biomarker, but across different diseases, just like this figure illustrates. So it's like a basket where you um, picking all um, the, the, same, the same marker, but uh, across different histology groups. And mostly, it's mostly a non-randomized study with the over objective response rate as the primary objective, uh, a primary of end point. This is a published example of using the basket trial design, or where you have a, um, a relatively rare mutation called BRAF V600, and it had been shown some activities uh, in um, previously. And uh, uh, I've got in which disease, but then they quickly expanded to other uh, other diseases such as lung cancer uh, and all other and, and many other places, breast cancer, ovarian, all over the place. So as you can tell, it's essentially a, a collection of enrichment design trials across different disease types. It's aiming to investigate if we can extrapolate. And the biomarker drug relationship within a particular disease to all relevant other types. And as you can see, it's uh, most suitable for discovery purpose in early phase two or pilot efficacy setting. Um, and uh, it's very appealing, especially to patients, because it provides off-label use to access across uh, off-label use access across all diseases, many diseases. And the biomarker assessment can be conducted um, locally, although it's not necessarily, but because you're only involved one particular marker, and if the marker and assay is, uh, uh, can be carried out uh, locally, then that's a big plus from trial, trial perspective. If, um, so the big, uh, one of the major challenge of conducting basket trial is that whether the biomarker can independently predict the response regardless of histology. In other words, whether it is okay to ignore histology heterogeneity and pull patient altogether with the same action mutation. And if so, when? So this essentially ties back to whether there is interaction between the, the histology and treatment and, and many other things. This is not, and uh, there are, um, situation where we are able to ignore uh, such heterogeneity or show that uh, it does not matter much. And this is uh, one example that actually has been uh, already in practice where FDA approved the first uh, histology agnostic indication um, for pembrolizumab, which is immunotherapy for any patient with uh, this particular um, biomarker called microcyclite instable high MSI high deficient DNA mismatch, mismatch patient regardless of histology. And uh, this, uh, I should also mention that uh, this biomarker has also been um, first proposed and promoted by uh, Hopkins investigators uh, led by uh, Dr. 
root part of Augustine. And so if the if separate analyze another challenge that uh, for a basket trial is that uh, if we analyze separately for patient of, of each primary site, then of course there are a lot, much larger sample size required, then the feasibility become issue. There are some novel uh, statistical methods have been proposed, but now have been uh, implemented that where one want to cleverly share the response information across different uh, histology. So here is a brief summary to summarize the strengths and the weakness where I kind of mentioned that uh, because of, um, I want to highlight that uh, for the basket trial because the disease subtype is often prognostic, making the choice of endpoint is quite limited. And when you uh, combining a bunch of uh, single arm uh, enrichment trials, then without the compared arm, then not ab really able to distinguish the predictive from prognostic. And then the feasibility has always been an ongoing challenge. And the umbrella trial is uh, the um, is the, to, to describe a situation where we'll have one tumor type, but many marker cohort, and uh, Ideally, it will be used with used with a multiplex assay, where typically used for treatment arm eligibility. So you can think that you have a very broad uh, sequencing assay where you are able to identify many uh, patients into different different uh, sub uh, sub cohort, and then for each sub cohort, ideally you will have a uh, 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 corresponding target therapy that allows you to compare with uh, standard standard therapy. And uh, uh, in this setting, uh, it can be actually used for conformative purpose. And there are some um, well-known example in <clears throat> funded through NCI mechanisms through some collaborations with industry, such as LAMP. Um, and of course, it's a cross NCI effort. And uh, in this, uh, because the fashion, uh, because the intent of uh, com to be uh, conformatory within each cohort, then what uh, you can consider is to maybe incorporate uh, to combine phase two and phase three together. Um, sometimes we call this integrated phase two and phase three. Um, but in the in the class that you basically using some intermediate endpoint to tell you that the weather you should go to go into phase three, uh, where you want to then formally uh, evaluate it through some conform based on conformatory endpoint, typically overall survival here, but a non overall survival endpoint here, and reduce sample size. And then uh, you can envision that you have you potentially can have a many many uh, integrated phase two slash three trials um, that to have a conformatory. Uh, umbrella trials. And so there are, of course, a lot of uh, challenges as well, as well as uh, um, operation-wise, uh, operation challenges, which I will touch on briefly. But uh, purely while we, um, but, uh, from a statistical perspective, uh, some ideas that uh, we want to at least uh, um, consider and incorporate, including that uh, um, using uh, interim monitoring very carefully and uh, efficiently and uh, <clears throat> uh, in terms of uh, sample size calculation and many other things um, uh, simulation is our uh, um, as our friends and uh, because these uh, uh, because the phase two endpoint is a non overall survival endpoint and the phase three is the overall survival endpoint. So it's hard to calculate by hand in terms of the sample size and all the operating characteristics. Um, the umbrella trial can also be used for discovery purpose. I don't think I will have time to elaborate that, but uh, um, um, I will just give one quick, uh, share one quick uh, uh, unsuccessful example where we carried out a biomarker-driven master protocol for previously treated elk positive non small cell lung cancer patient. This trial, we evaluated uh, um, um, quite a few, maybe um, over at least 30 um, drug biomarker combination stratum. 
And uh, in the end, after a lot of operation efforts, uh, we are not able to accrue uh, to the level that uh, we are able to meaningfully um, and conclude anything. And so in the end, uh, because of the landscape of uh, the drug development that also changed dramatically, and because the patient and population is so rare, we eventually, after maybe three or four years um, opening this trial, we um, closed it. So this kind of uh, um, highlights some challenges that we may be facing, even though that we may have a very uh, a good intention and there's a good uh, idea to conduct all these um, umbrella trials or more broadly, the platform trials. So I kind of touched on that uh, some uh, challenges that we may face with the platform trials. Uh, I think uh, uh, as now we have more experience when running by running platform trials in the COVID treatment, I think that this information hopefully will be better appreciated and uh, acknowledged across many uh, clinical trialists. So <clears throat> I will probably just uh, and stop here showing that there are certainly the advantage logistic um lo logistic advantages in theory but also um, tremendous challenges in operation as well um i think i will um my time is up so i will just uh, stop here and uh, to conclude that uh, the trial design that depending on uh, um, by trying to incorporate biomarkers, it depends on many additional factors. They deserve careful considerations, but when planned carefully, um, they will allow us to <clears throat> generate more evidence in a more timely fashion and to allow us to benefit to benefit patients in a more more efficient and uh, or with more with greater confidence. So. Thank you for your attention, and uh, 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 I'm happy to answer any questions if time still allows. Thanks. So, well, thank you very much for really a tour de force um, on the subject. I uh, We are out of time, so anybody who needs to leave to go to somewhere else is certainly welcome to go. Anybody who wants to stay and ask a question or two will stay open for another five or 10 minutes five minutes to see if there are any questions. So, looks like it was um, you completely awed them all. And I, I don't see a single question from the audience. Jay, any comments? Yeah, uh, okay, I'll make a comment, uh, Chen. I, I think you remember this. In the early days of the biomarker, uh, the diagnostics companies were coming up with um, their, their diagnosis to determine the cut points and, and uh, for, for these biomarkers. But companies were starting clinical trials using th that diagnostic, but the diagnostics were not yet approved by FDA. Yes. And it was quite a race uh, as to would, when, when the trial stopped, using the kind of designs you so eloquently described to us today, would, would the diagnostic be approved by FDA? And if it was not, uh, then what would FDA do? And of course, it's got the CDRH and the CEDAR. Uh, they rarely uh, talk to one another. And it, it was uh, quite, quite a mess. And then I, some of the diagnostics companies were in fact in uh, litigation over patent infringement, uh, bringing in still uh, uh, the, the legal process in, into it. So anyway, I, I just mentioned that I think we're beyond that now, but it it was uh, for a person like me serving on a data monitoring committee for these, we didn't know what advice to give to the sponsor. Anyway, ex excellent and comprehensive talk, Jen.
Um, thank you, Jay. I think that's a, a great, a great comment that uh, I probably uh, should spend some time to elaborate it by um, skipping some other materials. Um, so Jay actually uh, touched on a very important topic called so-called companion diagnostic development, um, because uh, actually in if you look at the FDA approval, uh, especially in recent uh, approval in, in immunotherapy, where the indication uh, is often confined to a particular subset of uh, a patient that based on, for example, the PDL1 expression level. And the, the diagnostic uh, assay that they used to determine these uh, uh, PDL1 expression level is often uh, is is actually, if I understand correctly, uh, tied to um, the approved drug uh, strictly. So, for example, gene text and drug will tie to, uh, I think that's their own diagnostic assay, and uh, this assay cannot be used uh, for other, uh, for example, Merck drug or BMS drug. And in their case, for, for if you want to use their drug, I think you need to use their approved um, assay. And so that's, uh, uh, I think that's uh, one important aspect in that uh, uh, within the any given trial, I think uh, it ensures the, uh, the internal validity for sure. But I guess uh, when, as now we have uh, multiple uh, immunotherapy uh, drugs that are available to patients and all these diagnostic tools are different. I think how that really impact and the patient care, I think is uh, actually another very different and challenging question. So that's my Actually, I, I heard, I think it was the CEO of Roche at one meeting, Roche at one meeting articulate uh, exactly that strategy. And they said uh, something to the effect that in the future, we were not going to be doing cancer trials across all diseases. We were going to be doing targeted cancer trials uh, based on biomarkers, and we were going to develop the assays um, as well. So we would assay everybody, and then we would efficiently do our trials in those people who are biomarker positive. And um, I think the tying of the assay to the uh, treatment is part of the business strategy uh, that you're in order to maximize uh, revenue uh, for the company. Yep, totally, totally agree. I think uh, um, some part of that I wasn't, uh, I, I purposely, purposefully um, spent some time on that, but uh, I didn't uh, uh, really elaborate the reason behind it. For example, the, a setting like this, we're actually in immunotherapy trials that uh, um, I would say that maybe published in the last two or three years. There I actually have uh, multiple incidents where the prospectively specified um, study design used this uh, marker positive overall design, where um, you first test the patient, uh, uh, the marker positive group, quote unquote, generic speaking. But then you hierarchically expand your um, patient cohort. And there are actually some uh, interesting discussion um, that uh, how to mitigate risk like uh, um, um, shown by Friedley and Korn here. Um, whether it's ethical to provide patients who may not necessarily benefit at all. And from company's perspective, I think using this strategy certainly is uh, very logic. It maximizes the opportunity to have, get approval for a broad population, but this not necessarily presents uh, an, the best interest of patients. So this is just a one simple example that uh, the complexity when you involve um, by marker, because Using simulation, it's very clear that this strategy is inferior to some other designs that I just talked about. But in practice, um, it's um, I'm actually working with uh, an, a student doing a systematic review and still ongoing. 
that uh, we identified maybe at least, uh, I don't know, 20 trials that published and using this design. So um, it's not a trivial issue at all. Um, and uh, for, as a business strategy, I totally agree with you. I think uh, um, by asking all patients and then try to quote unquote match them to some uh, some therapy would be um, uh, a wise business decision. But hopefully you get the idea that this is a very big, very complex business and how to match patients with the proper marker strategy, uh, marker stratum is not, is very complicated. Yeah, and it's hard to draw um, uh, credible evidence from them. Yeah, for the many reasons I, I just mentioned. All right, well, we are well over time, so we'll uh, wrap up now. Thank you, it was a uh, thank you. terrific talk and uh, we uh, look forward to future working uh, talks from you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, and uh, look forward to um, uh, to see if there are opportunities to working with your group as well. Thanks. Then I guess I just should uh, uh, leave, right? You're still here. Thanks.